the general approach to the series was not to get overawed by the spectacle and the visuals because it's very easy to just to make it beautiful and shocking and big and not and not really deal with the characters and the more real it is the more the actors can take it into themselves and and be those characters it's both giving the actors a chance to play larger than life but true to life at the same time okay, Rome was the choice because it's got the right light, it's got the right craftsman. There's the Italian sense of bella figura, of a certain way of carrying yourself, a certain dignity that was very useful for the actors. The actors who all had to essentially live in Rome for up to two years fed off that. And in the end, for me, in terms of background and authenticity, the most important thing, you've got Roman extras. <laughs> they talk Roman and they gesture Roman and they move Roman and they interact Roman. If you hire 400 people to turn up, you dress them all up and stick them in costume and they don't look Roman, you're going to lose a huge element of your show. OK, cominciate su! We looked at a lot of different places, and I think that our instinct always was to come here because this is where the story actually happened. I would say for me, as a director, that walking around the streets of Rome, it feels like it informs what you're doing. When you come on the set, you kind of feel like it's an extension of your everyday life. In whatever way that affects what you're doing, I can't help but think it makes it better. In terms of the art department and the hair and makeup and costume and photography, there's definitely something Italian in there. They have some instinct for beauty, they have some instinct to make things slightly lyrical. Somehow I think that's given us a level of reality which has been a fantastic addition. You know, I think if we'd have made it in a hangar in, uh, in southwest London, it could have been practical. I think something would have been lost. And that's before you start to talk about the lights. And somehow that informs it, the, the texture of the, the show, I think, will have benefited enormously from being here in Rome. We are working with a crew that already knows this period intimately. I think that brings us an immeasurable quality to the series that it wouldn't be there if we just plunked down sets and shot it someplace else. Yes, because yeah. if you remember, one was more yeah. straight, the other one she was more on the side. Yes. I think it gives it, and again, a bit of an immediacy that we're here, and a lot of people working on it are Romans and very proud of being Romans. So there's a civic pride that is injected by the crew, you know, and the crew have been amazing. They know that eventually when this comes out, this will celebrate their city. It really makes me happy, you know, to have worked in this project. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. <laughs> Seeing the pride that's coming through, the pride of the Roman people themselves, as you see around you, the set designers and, and the stunt guys and the fight coordinators, there's this, this immense sense of pride. So you can feed off that, which is just fantastic. It's priceless. It, it feels right that we're here, you know. It's, it feels like now that we're here, it couldn't have been done anywhere else. If you feel a little bit out of place or a little bit in awe of it, you just go down to the Forum itself and walk through the streets and see the bones of what we have here. What you get a sense of from the ruins that are left is that it was a real place, that it was a real city and a very like cities are today. I think it was very inspiring for the actors to be standing on the exact spot their characters stood on. It makes them real. To come past the Forum, the Colosseum, and down the Via Appia Antica, the old Appian Way, on the way to the studio every morning. And many of them said to me that it just got them focused and in the zone. We chose to shoot in Rome at Cinecita Studios for a number of reasons. Technically, it's one of the, the great studios in the world. It's 20 acres just outside Rome. It's famous because it's associated with the greatest Italian directors, and probably most famously of all with Fellini. Cleopatra was also shot there. So, you know, it's not just great Italian films, but gigantic epic films, you know, international co-productions and so on have been shot there as well. So it has a great uh, culture and tradition and history of, of uh, high-level filmmaking. 
And the other thing that Chinichita has is the back lot. Huge, gigantic, clear open space at the back, which of late has been extremely popular with international production as well. So two of the movies that had just shot before we went there were Martin Scorsese's Gangs of New York and Mel Gibson had also shot The Passion there. And of course, it's so huge, it was one of the only places where we could actually create the back lot set, the five-acre set. Unlike most people who came in with kind of historical research, um, Joe came in with off-the-wall stuff, Mary Ellen Frank photographs, so, um, pictures of Bombay and Mexico City, um, interiors from old Havana. Um, so it was clear he had a kind of both a, a rigorous technical skills, but also a fresh and imaginative aesthetic about what this should look like. And we wanted it to look both authentic and accurate, but strange and beautiful, and Joe got that immediately. A lot of the interpretations of Rome have been from classical painters of like the 17th, 18th century, in which case they're interpreting a, a kind of romanticised version of Rome. What we wanted to try and do was something that was more honest and true to life. This is, for us, is a big challenge, but if at the same time we could be scared about the scale of the project, but at the same time, we are quite proud to do it. The biggest challenge is sort of achieving it in the time and trying to get all those disparate elements. Also, not to make it look like it's been designed by one hand. A feeling that different hands have been involved in the making of it, which a real city has. You know, that's what the Forum always was. It was more like Times Square or Piccadilly Circus or something. There was always stuff going on, things being taken up, things being put down. It was an organic place. Whenever I take people round, I always start with the Forum. One of the things that would first strike you is uh, both the great scale of the place, but um, the busyness of it. It's a, it's a marketplace, it's a law court, it's a um, gambling den. It's all those things all at the same time, so it's a real heart beating heart of the city. It's by far the biggest set I've ever been on. It spreads over five acres. It's an enormous site. Over there is another huge area. Over there is another vast area. It, it just doesn't stop. Sometimes when you walk onto the Forum, you just pretty much takes your breath away. At this period, it was already 700 years old, so it's far more ramshackle and thrown together than you would think, and it's far dirtier and worn, and there's cracks in the pavement, and the paint is peeling. If you bring all of those things together, you start to get a feel of, of a real urban reality. Gladiators are one of the most famous aspects of, of Roman life, but the vast spectacle of the Colosseum was built about 100 years after our period is also not really representative of how of the gladiatorial world. It was a far more uh, small-scale and day-to-day -day event. There was not a dedicated single place for gladiatorial combat, a stone place dedicated to gladiatorial combat, really until the Colosseum was built. But uh, the gladiators continued to be displayed on temporary wooden bleachers in the way that we represented it. And the, a gladiator show could be put on anywhere, as we've done put on in the Forum. The historical reality absolutely informs and underlies everything in that space. And the Forum is the most immediately, dramatically, overwhelmingly impressive. God, you know, just the scale of it, because it blows you away, because it is just over 50% of the size of the real Roman Forum downtown. But the next thing that always amazes people is, and I say for my next trick, I always say, there's not a single piece of stone, not one, in the whole forum. It's all made out of resin and fiberglass. If you walk around the back of all the buildings fronting onto the forum, you just see all the scaffolding holding it up. So they're all just, it's all just a frontage, all made out of fiberglass. And the set, despite its immensity, was built in five months from scratch. And they had over 400 craftsmen from all over Europe, not just Italy, and some specialists in from India. There's also a good part of the set you can't even see, which is the whole of the set underground is cabled and also piped for gas. So all the torches that you see lit in the night scenes and so on, you never had the trouble of torture light because they're all gas torches. Rehearsing and action.
I think that the standards of craftsmanship in Italy are probably as high as you would find anywhere in the world for the construction of a set on this scale. And they're evident outside, but I think they're probably even more evident in the interiors and most evident in the houses of the rich. Um, this is the opulent villa of one of my main leading ladies out here. You can see they're lighting it and everything like that. The garden's being finished, plants are going down, gaps are being filled, sculptures are hopefully going in. But here you can see we're finishing off the floor, we're finishing off the wall paintings. We come through here and then we have different bedrooms. There's Octavia's bedroom being finished there. There's the main bathroom being finished here. Whole teams of people working here. It's Maria, leader of this team, has been doing all this beautiful work. And through here, there's these windows you can see through to Octavian's bedroom. Everything kind of interconnects and is quite a labyrinthine, because obviously we have to show a lot of stuff happens in these villas. You know, it's very, very important. So obviously we need to make it as interesting as possible so you don't get bored. The rich were unbelievably fabulously rich and could afford to live in luxury beyond our dreams. They loved color and vibrancy and, and beauty. There's an outward display of status and, and dignity that uh, was important to get across. Once we built it, the real challenge is to make it seem just a natural part of the background, trying to use this set as one would use uh, New York City, as a, a living, breathing thing that is another character in the, in the piece. Bruno's made a big thing, and I think it's absolutely appropriate, about trying to divest yourself of what I call Holly Rome, which is the image that we've always got from the movies and try and completely rethink that and put something else in its place. And you can put a, a modern Indian city in its place, Calcutta or Bombay, that immense mass of people, that riot of colour, that sense of smell and noise and busyness. And I think that's absolutely on the money. Right. So, sorry for all the fuss. Great, thank you. Okay. okay. And there are two notorious slum areas, if you want to call them that, of Rome, of which the most notorious was called the Subura. To get the real sense of how filthy it was to live in a world where there was no running water for the poor, there was water running in the streets. So the sweat and the grit is a big part of, of what you see on the screen. And certainly there were a lot of times that the actors were very uncomfortable, but only as uncomfortable as, as Rome's must have been at the time. We know, for example, that they lived in apartment blocks that were up to six or seven stories high. We know they were the victims of um, slum landlords who had absolutely no regard for their life. We know that the rooms in those apartment blocks got progressively smaller as you got nearer the top. So we know people endured conditions of really pretty abject poverty. By the end of the shoot, we had a whole menagerie. We had uh, fleas, rats, pigeons, hawks feeding on the pigeons that were feeding on the rats. It was a whole ecosystem in itself. What are you waiting for? Now, now! Senatorial debate was a pretty full-on business. They would bring the lictors in to arrest people, drag them off to prison. We got they'd punch people. People would fall on their knees and plead for mercy. And that's pretty much what it was like. I mean, Caesar was assassinated in the Senate by fellow senators, which is kind of strange when you think about it. As high-flown as the rhetoric was, they were also willing to pull out knives and kill each other when the need arose. Um, so we tried to get those two aspects of it in the same building. own account quite substantially to reconstruct the camps that you see in the show when Caesar's on campaign in Gaul. The Roman army on the move would be a vast city on the move. The Romans built a camp every single night. 
in a matter of hours that they would essentially build a, a fortress, put up a, a great wall, dig a great trench and, and put up all the, all the tents. It was one of the reasons that um, they were so hard to beat because they were, they were never uh, defenseless. The, the eagle of the legion, the standards of the legion, all those things were sacred to soldiers. The symbols of the legion and, and the, that life was everything to them. Okay, I'm the military trainer, military advisor for the show. So I was brought to train all the legionnaires, train the actors who have military bearing. We took 65 guys. They were told they were going to be treated like soldiers. We taught them how to march. We taught them discipline. The hardest thing was teaching them to get rid of their mobile phones. We dress like them. We walk like them. We act like them. It's a really great time for us. We learned Roman sword and shield fighting. They'd done push-ups all day long. They lived in a tent for two weeks. The only way they could clean themselves at night was in a lake. No soaps, no deodorants, no hair gel, which was tough for the Italians. They feel and uh, they look like soldiers. They're not just extras in costumes. We're showing how these cohorts fought and why they seem to survive so long. At Julius Caesar's great battle against Vercingetorix of, of the Gauls, there was 260,000 barbarians against 60,000 Roman soldiers, and they won. The method of fighting, the way of every 30 to 40 seconds, whistle would blow, or the centurion would turn his helmet, there would be a signal, the front rank would spin round, go to the back, the fresh guy would stand up forward, shields out, bang, and, down, and they're in. The guy at the back gets some water, gets, puts a new knife, picks up another spear. He's got about five or six minutes before he gets to the front line. By that time, he's fresh as the daisy, bang, bang, chopping him to bits. So you could actually have a career in the army. So happy with his uniform. I just couldn't believe how wonderful it looked. Oh, okay. <laughs> Hi there. I'm shooting. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting naked now. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse us. April came in and just knocked us over with enthusiasm and a keen eye. She came in with uh, not the, the cliches, but with a fresh imaginative take on it. And it was clear what we were going to get was someone who is a genuine designer of clothes, an artist, as opposed to someone just recreating historical artifacts. She went to India, which is where she bought her fabrics, and she did a lot of research and work out in India, and she incorporated that vibrant color into the look. Any of that stuff in the forum, it's, there are a few little dots of white in amidst the slaves dressed in those dun browns, and then, you know, women in oranges and greens and blues, and it's very colorful, as that Roman world was, extremely colorful. We're being as historically accurate as we can possibly be, we think. It's big. It's all over the place. There are 2,700 costumes in the first three episodes. Slaves. Beggars costumes, slaves, foreigners, to Julius Caesar, all of the nobles. She went off to India and bought this stuff which is so beautiful. I've worn a lot of corsets in my acting life and I'm so grateful for starters that this is the shape. It's, it's a very voluptuous look. It's a lot of fabric, it's a lot of round, it's, you know, it's that. And it's really comfortable. We're trying to use only the authentic yes, fabrics that they used in ancient times. Wool, cotton and linen. They even had silk from China. Julius Caesar was criticized for wearing silk because it was so expensive and so grand. I mean, we have a big department. We have the seamstresses, the leather worker, metal department. He does everything from brass helmets to jewelry. I think the workmanship that people have done on this, you know, the leather work and the metal work and all that, I think you could only really get here. It's all to such a high level, the workmanship. There's real sort of artisans, and they don't really exist in many places anymore. They made the original helmet for the legionaries, and then I went to India and had them duplicated. And then we have all of the people who fit, and we have the aging and dying department. 
We can't ever make them aged and dirty enough, it seems, but we try. After a ton of research, you just try to duplicate something wonderful and make it your own. I'm the prop master on the show, and I have to find, make, supply all the action props for the whole series. Stab somebody like that and pull it out again. When you feel the knife starting to go in, yeah. squirt. OK. Yeah. And then when you pull out, squirt again. This is a real axe, and then we have a, a rubber one made to copy it. Let's have a go. So somebody's sitting on a horse, they can wield this about and be quite comfortable with it, whereas if you're wielding this around, you've got to be Superman. This is Atia's whip, and she beats one or two people with it, so we've had to make some soft, lightweight ones, which we just transfer the handle over, and she can beat somebody with this, and it won't hurt them. When anybody goes into the public toilets, they're communal, half moon shaped, all facing each other. And when they go in, there's a gentleman at the door selling these, and this is your toilet paper. And we've had to create loads of maps all out of parchment. We've got some money on the table, thousands of gold and silver and copper coins. They didn't have real books at that time, so we made up a wax book. It's all Latin writing. These are uh, Caesar's standards. 13th Legion. They are copies of the originals. This is what we call a legionnaire's backpack. Here we've got a selection of spears for the Gauls. They were all barbarians. They all had long hair. Every scalp they took, there was another trophy for their shield, which made them bigger warriors. It is a daunting task. We had to get three episodes together in one go. We find all the reference books we can, and then we sort of create them from there. Ready? Point two frames. Here we go. And. We're so lucky to be in Rome doing this series. And Rome, after all, is, is inspirational, just being here. And a lot of the research I've done is going to all the museums in Rome. There's all those people that are working in the costume department. We've got prop department who are making all sorts of different stuff. We have Latin graffiti translated so that what we've written on the walls is real Latin abuse. I mean, the big sculptors, for example, sculpted from scratch. You know, we came up with the correct god. It's a big task. When they called us, I go like, Maurizio, well, let's go for it. And it's interesting. And I thought it would be a challenge. I thought it would be excited. I got to have a fun, no matter what. If you don't have a fun in what I do, there's no point for me to do it. It's just such a great job. I just love it. So it's something I've always wanted to do. It's like a dream that now I'm doing it. Writing a show like this is comparatively easy. You can invent anything you like on the page. To see it realized, to see it concrete buildings right there and actors playing the roles is uh, awe-inspiring, terrifying, and it gives you a great deal of respect and admiration for the people who actually build that to make it real uh, is, is an astonishing accomplishment. from the start that if we could stick to historical accuracy as much as possible, we'd get, be getting something fresh. Because generally speaking, Roman movies and TV shows take a kind of pastiche approach to the, to the period. They, they jumble up all kinds of things from different periods and overlay a, a modern morality on top. They said, we want the show to be as historically authentic as we can possibly make it. And the distinction there for me is that while the characters are dramatized characters, the world in which they're moving, the context in which they exist, was something that we could flesh out with historical detail. And that that process was something that HBO backed to the hilt. At this period, the world of Rome was a pagan world, a pre-Christian world, so there was a very strong moral code, but it was a complete reversal of our own. They were a completely different kind of animal. On the one hand, you have this incredibly civilized, sophisticated society that built you know, these amazing, extraordinary buildings, a very sophisticated system of religion, of gods and goddesses and order, and then on the other hand, were just brutally murderous. 
religion is everywhere in Rome. It's part of everything you do from the moment you get up in the morning to the moment you go to bed at night. But religion has nothing to do with morality. To the Romans, the gods were everywhere. So when creating these characters in, in this world, we and the actors had to be aware of the immediate presence of the gods. Ancestors of the Junia, we ask for your blessing on this man. Let his aim be true. You're constantly seeing the candles burning in the corner of the atrium, lighting up the masks of the ancestors. But you'll also see the small flame burning on the shrine to the household gods. You'll see Niobe in her insula, making sure that she shares a small part of the meal she's just had with the god or goddess. So in everyday ways, it's just constantly there. Divine Janus, I offer this feast to you. You swear on Jupiter's stone? I swear on Jupiter's stone. They have powerful gods, and I will not kill any man with friends of that sort. Caesar, for his own psychological strength, kept appeasing the gods and making them offerings. Makes an offering of his own blood for the gods to appease them. And it's just, um, whatever's out there, protect me, aid me. Priests. Crooks, many of them. I just talk direct to whatever god I'm doing business with. Bugger the priests. He's an optimistic fatalist, and we are in the hands of the gods. He has, uh, of occasion, will spread bet across the gods. He'll pick which ones he should be talking to that day, which one's possibly more useful than the other, which one he might need, so he'll be sending a couple of chickens here, a couple of doves there, maybe a goat here, because that's the big bet. He also has this uh, innate faith that uh, he's exactly where he's supposed to be. And that everything will be all right. The gods will see him right. Look here, Mars. I am Titus Puller. These bloody men might give to you. But in more spectacular ways, we've also tried to build in some examples of religious ritual that will probably be more surprising to an audience that, that don't necessarily know much about that Roman world. I do things that nowadays would be construed as evil, but there were different times and the alternative for not getting on and not advancing would be to die. So I'm going to use whatever I can to keep the survival of my children. When Atia goes to pray for the safety and the deliverance of uh, her son, who's missing in Gaul, and um, she goes to, to take part in a pretty extraordinary rite They're called the cult of Cybele, the great mother. It was a cult brought from the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and it involves sacrifice, large amounts of blood, a dead bull, several castrated priests, a lot of flagellation. It was completely horrific because I hadn't quite bargained on the amount of blood. And I, it was my carry moment, actually. I quite enjoyed it. Great mother says no harm shall come to your boy. Good. So there's a nice combination. You've got something that's vivid and extraordinary, but at the same time, real. You come away from it not thinking, oh, well, you know, they just made it up. It might as well have happened, you know, on Mars. No, it didn't. It happened in Rome. It really happened. The best drama is not about playing, didn't they wash differently, or didn't they eat funny food? It's about human relationships, and human relationships never change. I had to see my son. Well, you've seen him, now go. Niobe, racked by guilt for what she's done. She goes and prays wordlessly to the Bona Dea, to the good goddess. She's represented by this enormously large woman who sits naked and body painted, receiving offerings on the behalf of the, of the good goddess. She's also associated with those sorts of desires for where am I going to? What sense does my life make? Can I be forgiven for things? Religion was hugely important. It wasn't a monotheistic culture. Highly superstitious people. It was a beautiful depiction of the way in which popular religion may have worked in the busy streets of Rome at that time. Much more exotic and strange and unexpected and slightly bizarre than the Rome that we've been given all these years. Rome is also quite familiar. The basic human emotions, the ways they relate, the things that they care about, I think those are pretty constant. Caesar has abandoned her. We shall not see each other again. Just because of some foolish confusion. Servilia, we are done. And she curses Caesar. But this curse kit actually existed. So then I said to Jonathan Stamp, our historical advisor, well, if there's a curse kit, this is really quite the thing, you know, to curse people. And what might they have really said? I curse Gaius Julius Caesar. So he came back with a genuine Egyptian curse, which is 
absolutely chilling. Let his penis wither. Let his bones crack. And names body parts and goes relentlessly. Gods of the Inferno, I offer to you his limbs, his head. It's fantastic. Their gods competed amongst themselves and fought with each other. So people felt exactly the same way. We certainly have to free ourselves from a sort of Christian point of view. And that's a really interesting part of it because you forget how steeped we are in that. And that that's got nothing to do with this world. Absolutely nothing. Rome was a very brutal world. It was a very rich, successful society built entirely on warfare. Um, they weren't successful merchants or successful philosophers, particularly, or engineers. So a society based on that as the, the ideal is going to be more violent than most. So Romans, they're both brutal but free as well, and that's attractive to us, I guess. They didn't believe that pity, mercy, love were virtues. And the one thing the Romans weren't was weak. So they exist in a world where force asserts itself and might is ultimately right. Behind every great man, they say, there's an even greater woman. And I think and that's the same with my character. I think she should have been the emperor, basically, you know, but unfortunately, she was born a woman. Women appear very little in the history books because men wrote the history books, but women were incredibly powerful in ancient Rome, partly because the men were always away. The thing with Roman women is that, uh, by comparison with other cultures in the ancient world, they had more freedom, they had more latitude, they had more of a life outside the confines of the home. I think women play the sort of subservient female in public, but in the home, well, they run the home. I've been surprised how dynamic women are and how powerful they are. Obviously, they have to cloak it with all sorts of subtleties. The women may not have recognizable roles in, in politics, but they had an awful lot of influence. This time is a time of incredible turbulence and change in Roman history, the late Republic. And so all sorts of attitudes which have prevailed for hundreds of years are being turned on their head. And this particular time, by the sort of reality that's represented by a character like Attia. The historical Attia, the mother of Octavian, is somebody about whom we know a limited amount. But there are other women who I think Attia might have been like, about whom we know a good deal more. And probably most famously is a woman called uh, Clodia the great scarlet woman of the age. Absolutely scandalous. And she represented the polar opposite of all the traditional virtues of the Roman matron. She's very forceful and extremely powerful. Um, she certainly knows what she wants and she goes about all kinds of ways of getting it. Why are we giving gifts to Sevilla? When Caesar and his dog Antony are defeated, we'll need her goodwill. And this will buy it, you think? I don't see why not. Large penis is always welcome. That's the Roman way. I mean, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world there, and you have to be tough. Attia is an anti-heroine, an arch-manipulator, stirrer of trouble. Brutus will betray you. You seem very sure. His mother will compel him. She will not rest until you are dead. She really personifies that strange secret shadow role that women took in Roman society. We have a lot of powerful women in this, you know, not just Attia, Sevilla is an enormously powerful woman. In the immediate aftermath of Caesar, Sevilla then briefly emerges as just about the most powerful person, let alone woman, in Rome. She and Bruce were part of the family that founded the Republic, so politically she's at the heart of the Republic. Um, and a very high-ranking patrician. Mother is always nagging me to attend to politics. Well, it's been our family's tradition and duty for um, 500 years. Uh, it's such dreadfully dull stuff. Sevilla has a lot of influence over Brutus, her son. It's a very strong relationship. Rome has fallen into the hands of a corrupt monster. What would you have me do? She's also one of Caesar's lovers, but according to several accounts, the love of his life. 
she is intimately connected to two really famous men, but we've never heard of her. If you believe that their love and their attraction for each other is as immense as we're trying to make it, then what happens next is brutal. I must do what is right for the Republic. The Republic! Even though that he did love her, he did, but I mean, business is business. <laughs> he had several wives. These were political marriages as much as anything. People in those times married, it was usually because she was the daughter of someone. So you were marrying into that family. Very little of the arrangements were made through love. You had to get married to uh, the person that your parents wanted you to marry. And most marriages were either made for economic gain or political advantage or both. I want to marry someone I love. <laughs> <laughs> love doesn't come unbidden. You have to work for her. Strange marriage it would be if you loved them from the start. Varinus and Niobe were married very young. Um, probably similar to an arranged marriage. Where are you going? Business. For a young, marriageable woman, it would be absolutely expected that she would be a virgin. But to be married as a virgin isn't such a burden. It's not like you're having to hold on and cross your legs until you're 25. You know, you're going to get married at the age of 13. The animal urges that modern society represses in us were completely out there and in the open in ancient Rome. Come on, fight, damn you, fight! That's better! They didn't really have any problems with physical nudity and the sexual act. It was a pleasure. It was like food was a pleasure, wine was a pleasure, sex was a pleasure. There was no guilt. Bisexual, heterosexual, homosexual. The Romans didn't worry about any of that stuff. People did what they wanted and tried to get what they wanted as and when they could because life was short and very hard and everyone played by those rules, um, which makes for great drama. My name is Lucius Veritas. My wife was born here in the Aventine. I am as solid Roman as any man here. Cack! Why don't you shut up, you... Ladylike, Madame Ladylike. From time immemorial, men have thought they run the show, and actually they don't, women do. I think that's pretty much as it is now, as it's always been for thousands of years. They are wives, mistresses, mothers, sisters, and you shouldn't underestimate the amount of influence that, that they have. People want the same things throughout human history. Food, shelter, love, glory, fame. The only difference with the Romans is that they felt free to go out and grab those things in a more direct way than, than we do today. Maybe the single hardest thing we find to get around it with, with cruelty would be what happens in an arena when captured people are deliberately put on for the purposes of entertainment and are brutally murdered, tortured, sexually brutalized unimaginable things going on as part of an entertainment. How, how, how brutal must they have been to do that? But you understand that to them, the people in the arena weren't people. They were slaves, they were prisoners of war. They weren't Romans. So it was not cruel what you did to them. One of the interesting things to try and get right is the relationship between free people and slaves. To a degree, they have free will but it creates a whole different set of dramatic situations. You've got to bear in mind what being a slave in ancient Rome really meant. It's impossible for an American and I guess for any modern person to sort of think of slavery apart from race issues. Chain gangs in the American South, everybody's chained together, their life expectancy is very short, but it wasn't necessarily like that for all slaves in Rome. You got an incredibly wide range of experience in being a slave. How could you treat someone like that? If they can't hack being a slave, they can kill themselves. And it's an honorable thing to do if you don't like being a slave. So you don't accuse me of having slaves. This person has allowed themselves to be a slave. There were appalling conditions for slaves. The huge state-run farms, the mines. You went there, you give you three months, you might survive that long. But that's a, a tiny fraction of slaves. Many slaves are living in complete conditions of trust alongside their masters and mistresses, and very often they're freed. This was a very cosmopolitan city. Rome had already conquered much of the known world, and so there were people of many ethnicities who came in, both slaves and freed people who came in and intermingled with Roman societies. No one knows how many slaves there were in comparison with um, 
what you'd have to call free people in Rome, but it's a very, very high number. Some people have suggested it's as much as 70%. Think of how Rome was built. Thousands and thousands of people that literally died in the building of Rome. And the people they brought with them, I mean, you're talking hundreds of thousands of slaves, so that, to the point where they had one person just for the drapes, one person just to polish the statues. And if they did it wrong, you just took him out and replaced them. The slaves, they were maybe the most important aspect of the city. Without them, the city couldn't exist. Without the underclass, there is no upper class. They couldn't live in their houses, they couldn't eat, they couldn't dress, they couldn't do anything. Atia and Sevilla are both constantly attended by the body slave, who is a personal slave. And uh, it would be responsible probably for overseeing things like hair and makeup and their general demeanor and comportment, but is also there just as a constant companion. Marula is my body slave, which was a woman that was with them at all times, from when they went to the bathroom to if they made love to it, at all times, even in your most intimate moments. They do your makeup and your hair, but then they like stay with you all the time, all the time. That's a little too close for comfort for me. What have you done? Tell me. Promise you won't tell me. She's a sort of a black soul of her, you know. It's always present. She knows everything in the house. She knows everything of the private life of these people. She's probably known me since I was a baby. And um, it's like my mother. I care for her and she looks out for me. And should anything happen to her, I might surprise myself and feel one little tear roll down. There are, uh, you know, small and meaningful exchanges and, you know, you, you to imagine that this body slave has been around for quite a long time and is in a position of trust. What about bloody Lucius Verinus? Lucius Verinus is a son of a whore. Who is Lucius Verinus? I'm a body slave to Sevilla. I'm very close to her. I'm instrumental in leading up to Caesar's death. Senator Verinus. I come about your grandson, Lucius. I'm loyal. It's a fierce loyalty. These people were just there to service your life, and they were very lucky, because they're in a position which would be respected, and they're living in a beautiful house and being fed and clothed. Basically, buying slaves was a business that took place in a gigantic market at auction. Well, slaves were basically like buying a car. 55, 60, 60, sold! If you had one slave, that was okay, but if you were a three-slave three house, then it showed your prosperity. You can get second-hand slaves, unfortunately. There's also a rental slave market, so you can rent slaves for the day or for the week. What are these now? Leased. They look very good rates, too, and don't they look impressive? And uh, there's also a top end of the market. Being a cook or being possessed of, of a lovely singing voice or perhaps also just being possessed of great physical beauty. That's another of the things that people paid through the nose for, for pretty young boys and pretty young girls. And, you know, I don't need to explain to you why they may have wanted to buy them. Something exotic or else something young. They were just objects. I mean, like, like a table or a chair. Just your property to do whatever you wanted with. That idiot has ruined us all. Some slaves had a certain amount of status. If you were a very well-educated Greek, you'd be incredibly expensive, for one thing, and you'd, you'd be a very valued asset to whoever owned you and probably treated fairly well. They were used um, as administrators and treasurers and um, trusted advisors to many of the leaders. I had thought you understood the system. Caesar has a special relationship with his slave, Posca. Anything he does is sacred. In a way, he's a demigod. Caesar trusts them implicitly. Roman people are not crying out for clean elections. They're crying out for stability and peace. You can help save the Republic. In the end, Caesar actually says, if I don't come out of this battle, I just want you to know you will be a free man. Goodbye, Dominus. Goodbye, Posca. And it gives a sense also of the way in which I think Romans might have regarded slaves, which is curiously complex. It's both that they weren't really there, they didn't really count. But on the other hand, they were also really human, and they were people whom you could feel real emotions towards, and, and you could really even come to love. I want to free Irene. Slow down. Why are you freeing Irene? You can't marry her otherwise. I love Irene. The great prize held out to all slaves in Rome was the possibility of being freed. I'm setting you free. You're free. It says so here. <laughs> so it wasn't a dead-end trip.
If you were a bright slave, if you were a clever slave, a slave with accomplishments, you could make it to the top. There was a Roman dream, just like an American dream. You could make it. One of the things that's, um, uh, that always happens to you when you start to look at, at the Roman past is you get two sensations at the same time, which are apparently contradictory, and they are, golly, they're so like us, and my gracious me, they're so different. And those two things absolutely coexist. They're different from us because they value different things from us. And they value different things from us, these Romans, because they precede the single most important thing that formed our world, which is the Judeo-Christian ethic. They come before it and they exist outside it. There's an obvious reason for choosing a scene like this, the gladiator scene, because it's big, you know, and, and incredibly eye-catching. But there are two or three scenes, I think, that you could pick out of the whole run of 12 shows, which you could say are iconic in the sense they symbolise and pull together all the things that, the, that Rome is about, HBO's Rome is about. And I would definitely say that the gladiator scene is one of them. And I would say it's because it's spectacular, it's eye-catching, you cannot stop watching it, because it's extremely, I mean, it's, it's violent, but it's extremely visceral. And yet, at the same time, it's also surprising. It's cliche-busting in that it's gladiators, but it's not gladiators as you've seen them before. If you press it and you investigate it and you examine it, you can find that it's actually historically accurate. Thank heavens for that. Uh, in, in the sense that it's really about the kind of show that you would have seen had you been in Rome at the time. And then, last of all, Although it's big and spectacular on a big canvas, it's got a very intense personal core to it. It's got a, a thing going on in it in the middle, which is that thing that happens to Pullo when he's kind of saved from committing suicide. Well, in fact, he is saved from committing suicide by the one last thing that means something to him. And also, it personally zeroes in on perhaps the, the essential human relationship at the heart of the whole show, which is him and Verenus. Verenus, who's gone through an hour and a half, if you're a viewer of watching him, saying, he's dead to me. And suddenly the one thing that can propel them back together, and it's going to be the driving force in the whole show as long as the show lasts, is that relationship. The thing that reforms that relationship is the drama that takes place in the, in the arena. So it seems to me it, it sort of ticks all the, the boxes, all the things that the show's trying to do and that makes the show different from other um, versions or takes on ancient Rome that we've seen before. <laughs> We're trying to do a gladiator fight that doesn't look like any other gladiator fight. It's grisly and shocking. It pushes all the buttons we're looking, looking to try and push in, in the show. What we have going on is a culmination of weeks of work and months of scripts being written. So we've sort of pulled out all the stops. This is a very challenging scene because you're combining extras with dramatic dialogue scene with fighting. It's a big scene, but I think the hardest thing about it is really capturing the emotion of the action. It's a bunch of departments working together to get this whole sequence done. The challenge is always time and, and moving ahead. You can't really second guess. You just have to keep moving. Let's go! Okay, let's reset right away. The standard idea of a gladiator fighting was that in the Colosseum, it's a huge spectacle. What actually happened, certainly in this period, was that it was used as a punishment for criminals, so it was a much more prosaic day-to-day -day routine. We wanted to try and create something that was completely authentic to the time, to the late Republic. That's the crucial thing. This is just the beginning. It didn't get to be the greatest show on Earth for a, a good another 100 years. Ours is much more gritty, and it wasn't quite as well orchestrated in those days as it uh, became later on. Once we decided that we wanted to go with a more primitive version, it was then a question of bringing all the departments in line with that. So exactly what kind of weapons there would be, what the choreography would be, what the gladiators would be wearing, the fact that refreshments were sold, what the food was going to look like. It takes a tremendous amount of coordination with costumes, um, stunts, the art department, special effects, just to create the atmosphere that's needed. I kind of figure out what should be what, and then you get the input from all the heads of departments, and, and we all agree on how we think we should proceed with that. Pretty much after the fact, I do storyboards, so everybody has that as a guide, but it's only a guide. 
Once I start shooting, a lot of things happen, but you get a lot of things for free, so to speak, and I like to take advantage of that. Mikhail is start uh, also as DP, and uh, so it's nice to work with uh, someone that did your job, can understand your problem. You gotta use two cameras. Unless it's a stunt or a car crash, you tend to not use more than two cameras because the third, fourth, fifth camera, they get compromised in where they are and then you start composing your shot not to see the other camera. Can we see our gentleman lie down, please, Karen? It's amazing. It's, uh, yeah, the guy's so delicious. I've never known anybody throw a camera around like him. It's fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. We will do, from so many angles, we will use for sure crane, low angle, wide angle, uh, ramping, uh, change over crank. Uh. This was their justice, was that if someone is accused of, of murder and found guilty, this is the fate, and they would have to go in the arena and that became part of the entertainment. The great myth about gladiator contests is that they always ended in a death. Only six or seven percent of gladiator contests ended in a death. The medical support available for gladiators was superior to that available for the Roman army on the move. And that was, by contemporary standards, unbelievably sophisticated. You could patch people up because gladiators were so expensive to train and they were such valuable commodities that simply to allow them to die wholesale in fights was just not on for the people who ran them. And like anything else, this was ultimately a business. This whole thing is very Barnum, a slightly kitschy kind of entertainment. It's a little bit of a carnival, a little bit like a football match, kind of a boxing match, more of a populist activity. Caesar, who was the consummate showman, was the guy who really promoted gladiators as a mass entertainment. And all of this is part of that same sort of WWF. It's a bloodthirsty, kick-ass sort of gladiator battle. This is the most important way Caesar has of shoring up his support in Rome at a time when things were all still a bit rocky. It is bread and circuses. Pure scope of the sets was amazing. When you go in there and shoot, it's like shooting in any other city, basically, except it's 2,000 years ago. We're trying to get a real sense of the reality of how it would have been. And this is exactly it. We thought it'd be much more interesting to have the fight in the forum, using the forum as a background and presenting it here, and also in a square format, which is apparently correct as well. On the floor down there, the sand, which is where we get the word arena from, because the Latin word for sand is arena. They cover the floor in sand. The gruesome reason for that is simply because once the blood starts to flow, it gives you still a bit of grip. You get a bit of traction because the sand soaks the blood up. There were certain gladiators who became really popular and they would have the numbers of their fights and the ones they won. So that's what we're doing here. We're doing these, we're making up these big posters. But there are several different ways you could become a gladiator. The most likely way is if you're caught in war and you're a reasonably strong male, you're going to get screened and then they may put you in what's called a gladiator school. If you're a slave, and again, if you're big and strong, you may get turned into a gladiator. Those are the two most obvious routes. Surprisingly enough, some people chose to be gladiators because it was so intensely, unimaginably glamorous. There'd be billboards and banners with their names promoting them like they promote rock stars now. They are the genuine names of real gladiators. One of the sets of gladiators about which we know most fought in Pompeii. And of course, with Pompeii, everything survives in a way it doesn't anywhere else. And so we found out that gladiators had stage names, like Hilaris, the Joker. One thing I think that's important with a piece like this is that the background is the background. We're not doing huge establishing shots because the whole thing is about moving the story forward all the time. And then we catch Rome here and there and everywhere in glimpses. That's, I think, it's a much better way to show these fantastic sets off. It's like when you're shooting Toronto for New York, you go out of your way to make it New York, but if you're shooting New York for New York, you don't even think about it because you know it's New York. Tomorrow I enter the uh, gladiators arena to be put to death and uh, as part of the ritual beforehand I should be shaved and shorn uh, to add to the spectacle. So here I'm losing my hard-won hair. After a ton of research and watching every other gladiator movie since 1928 we were determined to do something a little bit different and in fact we hope a lot different. I want it to look real and funky and kind of uh, carnival-like. We think that all of these gladiators, first of all, are probably all prisoners from different parts of the world. They're supposed to look big and mean. This big man. <laughs> he 
with uh, we prepare with you know, all staff we cut the, there inside so it was is very horrible this is a great gorgon this is gladiator number two i think he gets his arm cut off augusto makes all of these starting from scratch and he made this and this guy gets his head cut off I like to shoot it in continuity because it's very hard to keep track of the continuity of the wounds because, you know, he gets a cut and the makeup puts it on, but then if you, like you normally shoot things out of continuity, you have to go back and check how was it, what, was it there at the time. When you throw it down again, at that point, the whole audience goes, Ooh. We need audience reactions from the extras, which is always harder than you think. I was actually toying with the idea of shooting most of the extra reactions first while they're still fresh and have the stunt guys kind of do the action for them. I think we're gonna have about 350 extras, but we're actually gonna make them look more than that. We, you can stack them up in a way so that it looks like more than that. He's lost his friend, he's lost his home, he's lost the love of his life, he's lost his legion. The man's got nothing left. He doesn't want to play, he doesn't want to fight, just wants to sit on the ground and have it over with. It's effectively judicial murder, because the idea is that Pullo's just going in there to have his head chopped off. The crowd are not expecting him to live for more than 30 seconds. They want a spectacle for the crowd, and um, he doesn't want to give them a spectacle. He just really just wants it to end. Stand up and fight. I don't want to. I just want to die, all right? But the one thing they do, they make a mistake. They insult the one thing that's precious to him, which was his legion. You and the whole 13th, not the bloody mollies. <laughs> Why don't you and the 13th all line up and suck my Here we have a retractable spike, which pull out a stick into one of the gladiators that's attacking them, which is a telescopic one. Attach this to his stomach underneath his costume, and as he's going over the air, you'll see the other end of the spear sticking out of his back. It's very hard in the script to visualize what the stunts are, what the uh, choreography is, and that's actually what I spend a lot of time with Frank doing, trying to work out a choreography. <laughs> to do a fight scene realistically requires a great deal of rehearsal and work because you can't just let them get their swords out and have a go at it. We're also in a, in a gym near the set. And as you know, it's organized for all the, the training of the actor. Giorgio was telling me that when it hits, I should go poof. But I quite like what you said, which is... It's not just about how clever the stunts are or how heroic you might look. They're, they're born the characters in mind, so the fighting is different. We are really lucky because Kevin and Ray are both strong. They want to do the best. They are really in good condition. Usually you shoot the whole thing with stunt doubles that look like them and it's dressed like them, but in this case we'll actually be able to uh, do most of it with the real actors. So we'll actually be able to, in the same shot to go from a wide shot to a close shot, uh, which is obviously a great advantage. I am never satisfied, you know. <laughs> of course, in the gym we did uh, we did some rehearsal perfect. Now we must do adjust hundred things. We try to be ready when we should. It's like they've worked out this wonderful dance, and all you have to do is hit the beats and do that and just be in there. They've made this happen for me. These swords just for the fight. So this is the real one for all the close-up work that you do. So it looks great for the camera. And then when we come to doing the stunts, we have these, which are rubber and a lot softer and safer. Today I got my arm chopped off, as we all know, um, unfortunately for me. These days, you can actually do it so realistic because you can combine visual effects, which is computer effects, with special effects, which is the floor effects, the, the mechanical effects. What we've uh, done um, a few times on this is to actually just go out in the back lot and, and shoot some tests. It's just so everyone's got a clearer idea of the kind of elements we'll, we'll need and, and how we'll put the shot together. We've got these, uh, these crosses on here that, uh, that we can use to give us a clean line 
uh, so we know where the arm's going to be severed. There's no actual sword, there's no blade. So it just goes through the air and then they put it in later on. It's very, very clever. This is the final, uh, what we came up with for, for the, um, the gladiator's arm being cut off. This is for the arm falling to the ground after it's been cut off. We also put in the wound bit of the arm that you can now see uh, severed and uh, some blood effects. Because it's very costly to do CG, so you have a prosthetic arm that replicates the one that we just had in CG to lie on the ground for the rest of the sequence. She put the there inside, it looks real. You're basically you're also chopping a head of a guy, same thing, you, you have a CG head you chop off and then you have a practical prosthetic head that you leave in there. Having my head cut off, a little bit of a worry, you know. <laughs> so we cut out. Yeah, exactly. But also more. Eh? We were talking to props about how we might shoot that and um, came up with the idea of uh, having a special shield made. Tomorrow when we do the real rehearsal, I'll measure the guy, measure the, how deep his neck is and then cut that out of there. It'll go straight over his neck without cutting his head off, for real. Then we'll fill in the hole in the shield uh, in post-production. I came here to Rome and I lost my head. Special effects guys, they supply blood pumps to get the blood to spray out after the CG effect is over. We have like 100 liters of blood that we are, have ready to throw on, and we have all kinds of blood squirts and blood elements that we're gonna add on to the blades and onto the weapons. We're gonna fill up the whole floor of this with the blood and everything, make it look really a healthy place to work in. The general approach to the series was not to get overawed by the spectacle and the visuals, because it's very easy to just to make it beautiful and shocking and big. It's really about these two soldiers, not about the blood and the gore. That's what it was like, so you have to show that, but it's really about those two individuals caught up in events much larger than themselves. The injustice of it all is witnessed by Verinus. Caesar has directly given him an order saying you cannot help Pillow because people who are associated with me cannot be seen to to help our veterans because they're causing trouble and are putting pressure on him politically. In order to be exciting, it needs to move and move fast. And we have certain cutaways where we're cutting to a, one of a characters that's outside the arena that helps. It always gives you a sense that it's actually been longer than what it really has been. It made both dramatic and technical sense to intercut the two. Essentially, Pulo's there because of Caesar's subterfuge, and Posca is about to reveal that fact to us. I think more than the action, the whole importance of the sequence is the bond of friendship. We're getting romantic about this, but... <laughs> wins the crowd around by the end. He's so zoned in about the one thing that means anything to him in his whole life. He's not even aware that he's winning them round. My character, well, we parted company, but uh, you know, we're dealing with all this shit and stuff, but in the end, it's a kind of boy's own moment. near death as you could possibly get. I was like, you know, seconds away from the killer blow. The one thing that trumps every other loyalty and every other ideal in the minds of a very pious man like Varinus is the bond that he made with his fellow soldiers in the 13th. So when Pulo cries out the family name, essentially, Varinus can't resist. It's like someone crying for their mother. The glue of that is, uh, is unbreakable. 
in the heat of the moment, just seeing the injustice, Verinus decides to go in and kick some ass, you know, and kind of save his pal. So I'm kind of flouting Caesar in the same moment as saving my friend. The great thing about this the sequence here is, is the story where Verinus stands up for Pulo. Here's a very, very end sequence of where our bad guys get nailed by his own weapon, and here he gets impaled by his own club, the, the, the human skull. So the idea is we see the two faces next to it, one dying and one his own skull, which is obviously a metaphor for death. Originally, we, we were just thinking about a simple pole with uh, the skull having a hole through it. This is actually before we roll two times. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. In this case, we, we realized that this was kind of a bit limiting because um, you're not just trying to fill in the, the clean background, you're trying to put pieces of Varanus back into the shot. So, uh, so that was where we came up with the idea of the telescopic pole. We start off with this, and then we go to this. Visual effects will add from my hand down onto here, and it will slowly disappear. It would just be a matter of putting the weapon in over the top of the pole. Like I said, very crude, but it, it, it's certainly helpful in, in showing everyone what we're thinking about. If you don't see it, that means it works. If, it's something, if you see the effect, that means something's wrong. So making everything look very natural. Um, where the characters, uh, Pulo and Verinus, are joined back together. It's one of the most incredible moments for their journey. Yeah, they've had years of battle, right, here we go. history together, and that's what kind of comes together. When you've been through something like that, you look after each other, you don't look after yourself. Hey. It's about the man standing yeah. next to you. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's... That's what happens. <laughs> the two of them are reconciled to the fact that they do have a relationship and they'll become sort of folk heroes. This is the best stuff, man. Yeah. Yeah. Like much better than doing oh. Living the dream. <laughs> you're not in the gym with a squared off mat working it out, you're actually in there. And obviously you've got the crowd as well. Once you get them sort of cheering, it's just like... You're just... <laughs> yeah, they're really into it, man. Are they? Yeah, yeah they're like method extras. <laughs> <laughs> and they're enjoying it. Yeah, <laughs> a bit of bloodlust. Looks like you had a rough weekend. <laughs> you should see the other guys. <laughs> What's left of them. <laughs> Under the protection of Pompey Magnus and Julius Caesar, Senate sits tomorrow. Be aware. No disorder will be tolerated. Pompey Magnus. I have a question concerning your friend and co-consul, Gaius Julius Caesar. Why does his chair remain empty? Why does he not come home? Everything that Rome's been about, ever since it started for 400 years, has been about not having a tyranny, not having one person in charge. He wants to destroy the Republic and rule Rome as a bloody tyrant! That's why! As the drama starts, there are two men sort of vying with each other to be that king, to be the first man in Rome, Pompey and Caesar. Caesar has been generous to the people because he loves the people as I do. They start off as great friends and they share the responsibility of Rome together, but there was always this tendency for the Republic of Rome to be suddenly taken over by an emperor. Caesar's term of office is over. He must immediately return for trial, else be considered an enemy of the Senate and people of Rome. Our beloved Republic is in the hands of madmen. This is a dark day. And I stand at a fork in the road. He was a severe threat to the established order. 
the aristocracy were very scared of him because he had these soldiers and he had the money and he had a, a great lust for power. In the beginning of the series, I'm not in Rome at all because I'm out in Gaul, which is France as we know it, creating mayhem and havoc, acquiring a huge fortune. Before you, Vercingetorix, king of all the Gauls, what would you have of him? He was rather self-obsessed and driven beyond belief to be the greatest Roman ever. Caesar! Caesar! He seems to have this idea of himself as rather godlike, so that's what he's angling for. Are you with me? Yeah! We're telling a story from the street level about um, ordinary citizens. Why is Rome not defended? Our boys scared him off, eh? That's the gods of abandoned Rome. Our lead characters are two ordinary Roman soldiers. Get back in formation, you drunken fool! who get caught up in the larger events of history. They didn't like each other, really, but they, they out-braved each other on the battlefield. <laughs> on certain occasions, they would each save the other one's life. They are the only two ordinary soldiers that are mentioned in Caesar's account of the Gallic War. You think we can trust him? No. Lucius Varinus. May his enemies flee from him. May their city walls crumble. This man is now Evocati. He's an example of the dedicated um, soldier, uh, and that's why Caesar chooses him as the man to have at his side, even though he knows that this guy does not share the same beliefs as him. What makes your man Varina so morose? Thinks we've committed a terrible crime. Shall be severely punished by the gods. He may be right. Varina has been away at war for about eight years, and during that time I've been at home. And Varina comes back. We want to try and explore that, you know, coming back into a house that is yours and to children that are yours and a wife that is yours. Ivy, what do you say to somebody who you haven't seen in eight years and you supposedly love? You're alive. How the hell do you react to that man when he comes back after eight years? You don't know him. You don't know each other. His children don't know who he is. Because this is your father. How do you regain trust with each other? I've been sullen and untrusting and cold, but I'm not made of stone. I can change. Caesar needs you. We have hard fighting ahead. I chose this path. I will follow where it leads. Allow me to pay the rent. Allow me to feed the children. His sense of honor becomes questionable as the series unfolds. And I think that's the kind of tragedy of it. Titus Pullo. He's a grunt. He's a soldier. He's a centurion. He's a fighter, he's a drinker, he's a womanizer, he's an all-round Roman. I'll always have a job for you. I'm a soldier, not a murderer. Is there really any difference? He meets trouble with trouble, or if you're pleasant with him, he'll go drinking with you. I like to kill my enemy, take that gold, and enjoy their women. Well, on, when was the last time you had a woman who wasn't crying or wanting payment? Just a little bit larger than life. I put Mark Antony up for election as People's Tribune. I had understood the Tribune to be a sacred and powerful office. Tribune? What shall I tell Pump? Excuse me. I'd forgot you. To see that Mark Antony is the greatest warrior he ever saw, and that's something. He's militarily incredibly bright, and he knows exactly what he's doing. He's very tough in battle. Rally to me. Rally to me. What he admires Mark Antony for is his desire for life, and also he knows he can trust him within an inch of his life. He's a very charming man. He uses his charm in an incredibly surgical, laser-like way to get exactly what he wants. Oh, God, your beauty is painful. Let me die in your arms. <laughs> and he's brash and arrogant, and uh, sometimes, you know, says things that he shouldn't say. What should be your punishment, Pompey? For betraying a friend? For allying yourself with these so-called noblemen? What punishment for you? Impudent whelp! He enjoyed convivial company. He enjoyed the ladies and the gentlemen and drinking and feasting. You know, he just lives life absolutely to the full, to the maximum. It's sort of the case that women are marginalised in Roman history, but we know a fair bit about them. If women are part of the families that run things, they do have influence. They are wives, mistresses, mothers, sisters. I swear, 
If Caesar were here now, I would stab him in the neck. She's part of the Julii family and is um, an extremely powerful part of the nobility. What a congruent of heroes. Such vim. I feel like Helen of Troy. Atia personifies that strange secret shadow role that women took in Roman society in which weren't publicly powerful, but in the back rooms and in secret, they were extremely powerful. To lie with my house, you'd have both coin and ability to make yourself king if you wished it so. And you would be queen. It's about how much they can use each other politically in order to gain status. And uh, Atia is brilliant at that. I think she should have been the emperor, basically, you know, but unfortunately she was born a woman, so she channels all her energy and her power into her son, who's also pretty special. You ride into Caesar's camp alone on a noble white stallion. Well, that's a gift you won't soon forget. Alone? You'll be perfectly safe. She's quite sort of domineering and takes control most of the time and causes a lot of problems to her son, sending him off to places he doesn't want to be. As luxurious as it was, there was no time for this sentimentality. Bring him back safe or I'll use the eyes of your children for beads. She loves him, she loves him fiercely, and she will kill for him. She's a, a brilliant politician. It is I who have lost faith. I want him dead. And that you shall have. I'm in a marriage that has been an arranged marriage by my mother. My mother's very ambitious, um, really wants the best for her children, really driven. It comes across as really vicious, but her motive is totally the best for her kids. I'm basically a pawn in, this, in the whole thing. You should be the first woman in Rome. Now, I often sort of question some of my character's behaviour and treatment of her children. Calm down, Mother Brie. Calm down, I've not even begun to get angry. But they had different sort of value system then. You still had to survive and it was still a tough life. And so there was no time for all this mushiness. Don't tell me what I will and will not do. Be quiet! Our relationship is changing quite a lot. It's at that point where I've realised she's not the be-all and end-all. My mother doesn't know everything. Thank you so much for inviting me. My pleasure, my pleasure, Sevilla. I insisted you come. We're kind of enemies, basically. We're not good friends, and yet we both keep up this facade of a friendship. She is a good cosmetic slave, I grant you, but a lover for Caesar. <laughs> Sevilla came from a very important family, part of the family that founded the Republic. She's interesting because she's absolutely at the heart of things. Sevilla of the Junii, pleasant honor it is. She was one of Caesar's lovers. How will you pay your debt? All that I have is already yours. But according to several accounts, the love of his life. Don't leave me again. I never left you. He had several wives. These were political marriages as much as anything. But his real soul and his heart, if he had one, belonged to Sevilla. It's passionate, really deeply passionate. She's also the mother of Brutus. Caesar was like a father figure to him. Tell you, Brutus, I'm at my wit's end. Arguably a story of betrayal of a son or to a father. It's tragic what happens. What happens next is brutal. This month's public bread is provided by the Caroline Brotherhood of Millers. The Brotherhood uses only the finest flour, true Roman bread, for true Romans. I guess this was one of the scenes on which we all had the most to do. I mean, I certainly did, because... Is it the biggest scene in the, in the season? Is it the biggest one? Uh, financially, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's the toughest, biggest, um, most dramatic, most extras, um, most money put into it in, yeah. in, in the show, yeah. And all done in two days? Five, six hundred extras, all fully dressed, a number of animals. Oh, you know. God, we had the oxen, didn't we? And just complex, incredibly complex. Yeah. It's not only all the people, but um, very specific action that... Um, you've got the soldiers' action, they've got to do their stuff. You've got Caesar in his chariot and petals that had to go up in the air, and so wind machines. I mean, it's not just a big spectacle, it's also a character scene, so we needed to get the big 
visuals and the small character moments um, all in two days. On a feature, you'd probably spend two weeks yeah. doing yeah. something like this. It's a military triumph for Julius Caesar. He's won nothing but victories for eight years, and this is an incredible psychological moment for him and for the Roman people. Finally, after having conquered in Gaul, crossed the Rubicon, dealt with Pompey, and now he's returning into Rome, and he gets to be a god for a day. The trouble with Caesar, of course, is that he actually believes that he's a god for slightly longer than a day, and that's when it just begins to go awry for him. Caesar actually had four of them because he was so successful in battle. And this is where the whole of Rome comes to celebrate one of the great generals. It's got a hugely important dramatic purpose in the series, which is this is the tipping point. Caesar before this point is a man, probably one of the most extraordinarily successful and amazing human beings who's ever lived, but still just a man. But at a certain point, he tips over into being something else. And this is the point, dramatically, that transition happens. Action, Caesar, motore, okay? And action. On a show like this, HBO goes to a very short list of directors who can handle something of this scale in the time available. Uh, it's a very tricky job because you both have to have the sensibility of a feature director and the speed of a TV director and the bravery of, of uh, uh, a higher wire acrobat or something because a great deal depends on getting it right the first time. Alan Taylor was chosen because he's both fearless in that way and he's a great director of the small moments of an actor and is able to pull the best out of a huge visual spectacle, which is actually very rare. And he's coming through the arches. And we cut. Great, one more. Alan Taylor is just wonderful directors and a lot of great work for HBO. And we wanted to get him on. We thought, given his particular skills and his visual sense, he'd be a great choice for that. Unlike most scenes, I never storyboard as a director. But on a scene like this, you have to storyboard to give all the departments a chance to be ready for it. And I'm sure the editor will sort of cut it according to the storyboards. But when you shoot this way, you wind up with a lot of material that you didn't expect. So there will be a, a second cut that really tries to exploit the material that's there. Uh, relax the actors. Thank you, Bob. Uh, we're going to have three cameras on uh, Kieran. Because of the complexity of the scene, it may only be on the screen for four or five minutes, but we've broken it over two days. We're doing all the very wide shots with the maximum number of extras, the most set dressing to give a sense of the scale of it. Tomorrow, we will be able to focus more on things like this. Uh, you know, what Mark Anthony is thinking as Caesar comes in. and what Mark Anthony thinks of Atia and Atia, how she feels about him, because that's also part of this big scene, but today was <laughs> There's a child's point of view that carries us into the scene, which is a big defining element of it. It's very much the style of the show that we start very small on the family fighting through the crowd, and only through her point of view do we get access to this big thing. The director wanted that sense of wonderment for the first view of the forum and the glory of this day to be seen through the eyes of a child. The sheer shock of that and the fantasy of that. So that will be the introduction to the sequence. A little lower, a little bit of armor. They had the block, huh? They had the head, be, yeah. the head okay. be there a little bit, that's okay. As you can see the crowd here, you see what, uh, 700 people? Alan's uh, as a director <laughs> making faces. <laughs> Don't you have some work to do? Uh, yeah, I have some work to do. The DP, Alex Sakharov, is always brilliant. Uh, I have three cameras. One of the cameras over there is simulating a girl's point of view through the crowd. As uh, Mr. V, we call him, Mr. Getrix, is being led through. And as, uh, as the procession happens, as the Caesar enters through the triumphal arc, then the girl is being helped to climb on the pedestal by the horses. And then the second camera, which is a crane camera, is going to simulate my point of view from up there. And from there, it's a sweeping shot where it begins uh, down below. And hopefully, if you photograph it right, uh, you'll see it later. 
and then we followed her from behind and opened up the entire square and asked her point of view. In the back there, in photographs, just the details. The, the armory, the trumpets, the horns, the shields. Getting reactions from the audience is a huge part of it because it's a big act of theater that Caesar is providing for his subjects. a very manipulative gesture he's doing, and we had to watch how it played on the mob, the audience. We're trying to give a sense of how this would have looked to the average Roman man in the street. Sometimes you get a glimpse of the vastness of the thing, but other times all you see is a glimpses of the, something marvelous but obscured by all the other people who are here. The language of the show is to be fairly specific about what you're looking at and feel like you're sort of getting behind the scenes and to a sort of a reality. And if you had too many cameras, it tends to turn into big budget shooting where you just kind of get stuff and we wanted to make sure it stayed focused. A triumph is, is it's many things at the same time. It's, uh, it's like a ticker tape parade for a triumphant general. Um, it's a religious event and it's a social event and all those things in Roman culture are very much tied together. In a triumph, the, the general, in this case Caesar, is being elevated to a kind of, for the day, to, a, to the level of a demigod. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's exactly. Is that, is that good? good? Absolutely, bang on. Really. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, I think that's exactly it, and I think that um, you know, it's uh, it's re it's religious, maybe in the sense that you get to be not just as the, as the triumphal general, you get to be not just any old god, you get to be Jupiter, the king of the gods, biggest and best, the Romans called him, and you get to be Jupiter for the day. That's why he's you know, got that red stuff on his face. It's because painted red because that's Jupiter's votive colour and you get to wear this outfit that was kept in a special room in the Temple of Jupiter and, and so that is who you're being. This was cool. Yeah, I think more anxiety surrounding the whole thing given costume department, for example. Oof. And they had all these costumes to make. They were under a lot of pressure. The ancient Rome was quite colourful. You know, everything was painted. The statues were painted, the temples were painted. It wasn't all white marble. You know, purple was a royal colour. Octavia's wearing purple. Less was certainly not more, which was three and a half hours of makeup and hair. Oh, I see. This is you mean you, the hair should be on this side. Which is that right? Yeah. Atia's wearing red. The red is really significant because it's associated with Jupiter, and this whole day is about Jupiter. It's sort of uh, daubed in red. Mixed with the, uh, the gold and the red toga should give this idea this is something above uh, humanity. Not quite up there with Jupiter and Juno, but uh, reaching up for it. Calpurnia is wearing a kind of red-orange, and then Marc Antonio, to make him stand out, I put, put him in silver and blue, and it really is wow. <laughs> oh, stop posing, James. This is a very gaudy costume today that I've got on. This is a special triumph costume. This isn't something you normally see Mark Antony in. He's normally quite a plain man, and he's a soldier, but uh, it's like, you know, Sunday best. At least got out and polished off. I have like a whole army of seamstresses, and even when the girls who are dressing have a few moments, we go back into the wardrobe department and take the veils out and put more details on them. You know, flowers, stripes, anything to make it look like it's not just a flat surface. We want it to have a lot of depth. So it's a big collaboration with all these wonderful artisans that we have here. It was a, a gargantuan task, both on a logistical level and on a creative level, because it's none of those clothes are just taken from prop houses or from old, old Roman shows in the past. They're all rigorously researched by April and Jonathan to be true to the ex this exact period. Well, oh God, extras turned up at four. four the extras in the would have turned up at four in the morning for that big day twice. So, um, yeah, and they, of course, they're exactly right. They all have to be out and ready to go, you know. When we, I can't remember when we actually would have turned over for the first shot, but probably about 11. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you've got seven hours of preparation before mm -hmm. um, you can turn over for, a, you know, the first time. We have 500 extras, 140 soldiers dressed. Everyone's here. All the citizens are here. Really, Roman society was phenomenally hierarchical, and everybody knew where they stood in the system. And there's only a few occasions when everybody gets together in one place, from the lowliest slave right the way up to all the representatives of the patrician classes. The big deal about a day like today is that it would all have come together, and that's what's unusual about a triumph. For us, it was born in Rome, 
and we like to stay here on the set in the old Rome also. So it's very, very fantastic. We are proud. Lots and lots of people. We've been here since 4.30 this morning dressing everyone. Oh, we have a big, huge tent that we've set up all the men and all the soldiers. And then we're using our wardrobe department for the women's dressing. And we're finding the men are so much easier than the women. Isn't that amazing? The job of getting 500 extras in period costume, period haircuts, period makeup. You spend three hours just moving, removing people's tattoos. We have just one person just doing that. So it's a vast group of people uh, who are working for the moment the sun comes up and, until we get through the whole day. Ferrari, pronto? Okay. Facciamo senza carretto, eh? No part. Probably the ADs have the hardest time. It's the AD's job to sort of do, look after the elements of the big picture, the, the background, but today the background is foreground in a way. So they're really shaping the content of the frame a lot. Who was playing this yesterday? Every soldier is being spoken to by an American AD, an Italian AD, and a military advisor. Today we have to march perfect step as the elite Roman army, this is Caesar's legions marching before him. So getting guys to come in at 4.30 in the morning, dress up as soldiers and disciplined is a bit of a challenge. And I learned very quickly that Italians love mobile phones. They whined for their mobile phones from day one. We've had some dailies ruined. We found that a lot of the uh, extras as playing soldiers are using their helmets for storage. So they had cigarette packs, they had their cell phones, and the end result is they start marching and the helmets start slipping. So we've had a rigorous inspection of all of that. We agreed in a pre-production meeting that we keep a good eye on that today. When you do something like this, you have to bring another 50 soldiers to fill the scene to look like the glorious 13th Legion. I knew I'd put my boot camp guys at the front wherever the camera was, and then the guys that we only spent a little bit of training with, you put them as the musicians, you know, you put them as the static guards. Some people disregard the fact that they're extras. That scene was undoable without them, so I put them back into the moment that they're wearing the uniform. It's not just about being an extra on a TV show, it's much more than that. This is about having pride, this is about representing your own ancestors. The Roman Empire was such an important thing for the whole history of the world. You know, they're, I mean, they were me. <laughs> and the guys that work with us are so nice. And I mean, it's awesome. I think they were fantastic. I looked at the dailies and it looks magnificent. I think this country, besides being great at I mean, there's many crafts that Italy is so wonderful in, and actually the extra work is pretty great too, I think, and so they're pretty dependable. The single memory I have most from the day is that, particularly for the big stuff, which is obviously the most difficult to organise, not only have you got all the problems you can imagine, when you've got extras and you've got different languages and you've got animals and you've got the scale and the scope and the crowd and all the rest of it, but also when you actually, for the biggest shots when we shot, you had these enormous wind machines on to drive all these petals up into the air. So, along with everything else, you couldn't hear a thing. Good for sound. There's no point in getting on the walkie-talkie and saying, could you just move so-and-so a little bit over to the right or to the left, because no one's going to be able to hear a thing you're saying. So they had to be super prepared before they shot, and uh, that stuff ultimately comes down to, uh, to ADs. Julie Bloom is the main AD, and she's really good at her job. She go again. Well, yeah. She moves the extras along, she also moves me along, and she puts a grumpy face on whenever I'm not moving fast enough. Okay, here we go, please. Even with this huge number of extras, we can't dress this top corridor with the uh, right number of people. So we're going to have to replicate those people with visual effects department to give the impression that that entire top corridor is absolutely heaving and packed. It's the biggest thing we've, uh, I think we've ever shot over the whole course of this show. And uh, we have more extras, biggest set and set dressing and everything but it's never big enough, no matter how big you make it. We're able to use um, real people as a 3D layer in a crowd replication scene, so we can make uh, 300 extras look like 3,000 extras. Once we get up to 50 or 60 different people, and, and each of them are in different positions, we can pretty much go anywhere you want with that. It's almost like a noise pattern. Once you get beyond a certain distance, we can keep their face the same, but we can make their clothes shift through different colors. I'm here to put things in blue screens and uh, continue off the streets and the buildings and the hills of Rome and so there's no sort of like enclosed feeling here that whenever you see off the set you see real Rome as it was. When I first met Joe Bennett, he showed me around the set and while it was under construction and I just kept repeating myself, this is so big. And I said, 
I'm gonna just apologize to you now because people are gonna think that I did this. It's just too, <laughs> too big. People don't build sets like this anymore. The set's incredible. The set is amazingly accurate. So really all we had to do was just fill it up and shoot it. It's massive, it's completely realistic. I mean, the most beautiful sets I've ever worked on as an actor. Joseph Bennett, who's the production designer, in terms of we're using the full width and scale of his set for only the second or third time here in the forum. And we're seeing virtually all of it by the time we're taking account of all camera angles. This is an early sketch that we did for the Triumph that we've just shot, putting Caesar at the back here using our big forum as the background and putting some banners around here. These banners don't really say very much, so we drew up a big banner like this with velvet and big Caesar's eagle in the middle and made a number of those. This is the early sketch for Vercingetorix's cart, which is the killing cart, so we thought that should be ceremonial but vicious. And now Caesar have the opportunity to show to all Roman people that uh, I am a loser and is a winner. And today, I will die in Rome. <laughs> so then we, we adapted it. This is a version two of the cart. Um, version gets a bit strapped to the front. In the end, we actually ended up putting him centrally in the cart to make it even more of a something one can view from all around. You know, they wanted to strangle him slowly, so it's not something where he would be killed instantly. You wanted to get the, the length of torture. The idea that this is kind of dark and gruesome in, in counterpoint to this really festive Caesar's, you know, the reds and the golds that we use to, to show he's in power. The set dressers had a huge task because the forum is usually just dressed for a sort of business as usual, and they had to represent all this, the banners, the garlands, the, uh, the structures that were built. So sets had to do tons of research and uh, building. They were, the paint was wet when we came in this morning because it was down to the last minute. Inevitably, it has involved every single department. They would have been going nuts with the incense on a day like this, so we need to smoke up. So I go and talk to Daniel in special effects. We actually use the same incense that we did research on that the Vatican uses for the Pope. And we have a lot to do with recreating the atmosphere of Rome, basically, of how it was, because historically it was much different from what they actually say it was, because it was a very dirty and wet and damp because of the aqueducts. So there was a lot of activity going on between fires and smoke and leaking pipes. Stunts are obviously involved because we've got people up in high places who are dealing with all the petals, the petals being an essential part of the whole religious ritual. So We're using our big fans all around this big square and we're blowing them into the air, thousands and thousands of bags of petals. And uh, obviously, the second we started doing it, the wind picked up, and so uh, we're kind of fighting, fight, battling the wind, but uh, it's actually worked out great. I spoke to Arthur Wicks, and we had a joke about what his budget was for rose petals for the scene, and he wouldn't tell me. <laughs> I kept pressing him on it. I said, look, come on, just tell me. Tell me how much you're spending on rose petals, and he wouldn't. <laughs> so it must have been a lot. <laughs> You're going to get so many people writing up and phoning up and complaining that's not right, that's not right, and I don't try, try not to give them the opportunity to have a go at me about it. You're taking the, you know, this great force against which you've, you've been in conflict for hundreds of years and you are sacrificing literally the man who represents them, their symbol. If you read accounts of public executions in Britain in the 16th and the 17th century, it's, this, it's very raucous and, 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 and loud and, and drunken up to the, the moment of truth but the moment of truth when the person is actually dispatched and executed is very often accompanied with it's kind of like a religious reverential thing at which prayers mm -hmm. were said and people in the crowd crossed themselves the sense in which you gain strength by taking your enemy's yeah. life is probably a universal yeah. feeling amongst certainly amongst more primitive people to a degree and you know even today there's still elaborate rituals around surrenders in which you humiliate the the opposition in a ritual way um, but to a degree, everyone understands that, you know, in their soul, um, if, you, if you defeat someone, somehow whatever strength they it had comes into, you. comes into you. The sacrifice they make is Vercingetorix, who is the chieftain of the Gauls, who very nearly brought Caesar to his knees and is a hugely respected foe. And they basically torture him in front of everybody. There was a great deal of respect for the Gauls as the kind of, they were the traditional enemy of the Romans and they were considered a, a, a brave, strong 
great people. And the, by killing Vercingetorix in that public ritual way, the Romans were, and Caesar in particular, were kind of taking his power for themselves. They didn't have any xenophobia or, or prejudice against other cultures. On the contrary, they took it in and absorbed them. The ritual execution of his great enemy, it's as if the life passing out of the enemy passes into Caesar to give him new life and passes into the whole of the Roman people. Where they're witnessing that as a religious act, not necessarily a sadistic act, and it's about sort of spiritual transfer. Caesar at this moment seems to proclaiming himself not quite as a god, but wanting to be one of God's representatives on earth. I'm tending to shoot him as a kind of icon more than I ordinarily would because here today he's turning himself self-consciously into a, an icon and a, a demigod. So frequently he's very big in the foreground of our frame, frequently shot from behind with the crowd that he's playing to, and we sort of sparingly get access to an intimate close-up. A huge amount of psychological conflict in this crowd looking at him. And as Bruno says in his camera notes for the episode 10, the symbolism is obvious to everyone. There's just one ruler in Rome now. There's lots of unhappy accidents, <laughs> but uh, happy accidents. This is another reason Alan Taylor is such a great director, is because only good directors can identify and grab those happy accidents um, is there's a, there's a moment where a, a big red banner comes down from the roof. It's a very beautiful, slightly surreal shot. And Alan just saw them dressing the set and saw this rather beautiful gliding motion that you get if you were right underneath it and shot it. So the director always needs to be open to those kind of things and be aware of them when they happen. Uh, which is a very difficult thing to do because most people would just be gripped by the fear of, you know, what they're supposed to shoot, leave alone stuff that isn't you even on You might just get, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. News from Rome? My daughter Julia has died in childbirth. I agree with you. Pompey will be needing a new wife. Uncle Julius intends to marry you to Pompey Magnus. My personal standard was stolen by brigands. The legions were already homesick and surly when the eagle was taken. Now they're positively mutinous. Legionary Titus Pullo, you are to be released to the command of Second Spear Centurion Lucius Varinus to retrieve Caesar's eagle. <laughs> I am a Roman citizen of noble birth, and I order you to cut these ropes. Say please. Pullo. Blue Spaniards. One of Pompey's men. The battle begins. What happens in January when your term runs out and we're still sitting here? Three hours away from a wife he hasn't seen in eight years. The man's terrified. You're alive. We are here to discuss Caesar's resignation. What should be your punishment, Pompey? For deserting the cause of your people? For allying yourself with these so-called noblemen? Impudent whelp! By order of the Senate, Gaius Julius Caesar is declared an enemy of Rome! The nobles say that he wishes to march on Rome and make himself king. No man of honor would follow him. Well, I'm no man of honor, then. Our beloved Republic is in the hands of madmen. No blood! Are you with me? What's going to happen? is going to happen. Caesar has crossed the Rubicon. It's an act of gross treason. <laughs> You'll never see your husband now. Him and all the rest of them are doomed. You don't know that. Everybody knows that. You cannot stay. I can do as I wish. If Caesar were here now, I would stab him in the neck. I'll give you a moment. If there are gods you'd like to speak to. I've done my duty and I have sinned enough. I resign. You can't just leave the 13th. That idiot has ruined us all. You have lost Rome.
It's not certain, but I'd say your secret's safe. Tell me you love him. I will go away and I will never come back. Without the gold, he has nothing. You've entered the city under arm. The gods know my intentions are peaceful. We have hard fighting ahead. I'm fighting against Rome. Blood is blood. Whatever misfortune befalls you, we're still friends, no? At sunrise, everyone in Rome will know what you did and where you are here, in my house. The tide turns already. You vowed you would hold your peace. Have I not held my peace? Suppose you saw something which made you suspect something. Something terrible. He knows, Rissa, he knows. You seduced him, you sly little fox. Don't leave me again. Be rid of her or divorce. No. We'll follow. This man has done faithful vigil for you. Take him under your protection. He said he will be in your charge. I'm a soldier, not a peacekeeper. Did he not surrender? There are other ways to make money. The ram has touched the wall. No mercy. My dear Mark Anthony, I find myself badly outnumbered. Now Pompey is chasing me. Caesar is doomed, and you with him. Whatever others might do, you are blameless. I know that. I'm thinking ahead. You've put off this moment long enough. I shall be a good politician, even if it kills me, or anyone else for that matter. I may not leave her. I'd rather die than leave her. You're a thief and a whore, and you stole my heart on nothing! You could be the first man in Rome if you wanted. I hadn't thought about it like that. Decisive battle begins today. We must win or die. I just want this vile war to be over, one way or the other. The Republic lives as long as we do. Do not talk to me of the Republic. I don't know if Renus is alive or dead. A man should be made an example of. It is I that offers mercy, no one else. This is where we die. Domino, word from Greece. defeated Pompey Magnus, I think I can handle a small boy. We were going to make him a body, a moving arms and legs. He was a consul of Rome! Give me the man that took Pompey's life. Jack Caesar, are you serious? Your name would live forever. Who knows where Cleopatra is? I shall find her. She wants me bad. <laughs> Majesty commands you will enter. I am your slave. For an oath of loyalty. Not to Antony. Nothing escapes me. The Julian sun has risen and banished Pompeii Knight forever! Are you home for good now? No more soldiering for me. Oh no, you, soldier boy. Do not let me see you on this street again. With the gods' help, I can destroy him. Tell me a secret. Something shocking. What sort of man asks for mercy? I am not proud. Lucius Varinus will apologize to me. If he does not do this, I will come here and kill him. She lied to turn you against me. What have I done? <laughs> Senators, join with me in building a new Rome. 
oppose me, and Rome will not forgive you a second time. As long as you and I know where we stand. Where do we stand? What have they done to you? Justice will find them eventually. I'm quite sure of that. I forgive you. What if I don't forgive? You said Caesar was a traitor, and he tosses you some coin, and he's savior of the Republic. Stand up! You might have me killed. Stay away from playing and being God. I'm not playing. A new era begins for all Rome. People will not accept a tyrant's death unless Brutus holds the knife. You have some work for me. Come back tomorrow, same time. You have corrupted one man and saved thousands. I need your help. Can you talk to her for me? You're in every war with a knife at my throat. Only tyrants worry about tyrant killers. I can't call the boys off now. You don't understand what is at stake. Fulo's life. I must do my duty. He knows. We must act soon. He thinks we are cowards. Guards and keep my enemies away. They can do nothing about my friends. This is not some cheap murder. It must be done honorably. With our own hand. You present me with a dilemma. What am I to do with you? What's wrong? We must reckon with Lucius Varinus. I will make you suffer slowly and deeply. You'll make a lot of men very angry. 